I've just realized that we covered already chapter 31 of the book of Jeremiah, which is wonderful. Just like we see in the history of the house of uh, Israel, there were those who were constantly rebelling against God and those who were always going contrary to his way. We see through the book of uh, Jeremiah the same the same kind of phenomena is happening and we have the false, those false prophets who were preaching about peace and peace. Just like the prophet Isaiah says, well, tell us smooth things, people say. Don't give us these bad things and so on and so forth. In any case, uh, you might have uh, remembered that uh, we often said how the church already, the New Testament church, right from its inception in uh, the year 3133 before Christ, uh, sorry, 3133 RHAD, Anno Domini, so-called, that the church was also infested with all kinds of heretics and all kinds of those who fell away later. And uh, by the time, the commentaries would say that uh, the original church, as Christ founded it and left it, was one kind of organization. And then all of a sudden, when we raised the curtain in the second century, the same very church was something completely different. Uh, it was not even anything like the church in the first century. You might also remember that right there in the second century, we had the continuation of the true church embodied through Polycarp of Smyrna and the church era described as the, as the church at Smyrna. Now I was thinking history is always, history is the teacher of life. <laughs> That's the saying in my language. History teaches us life. So I'm thinking that perhaps we need to be aware of some of those things that happened back then, because we see the same phenomenon here, dear brethren, here in our time, in our age. We see the Gnosticism. Gnosticism was a very kind of complex philosophy as well as doctrine in the first century, which originated in the first century. And Gnosticism and doct as a doctrine as philosophy was already part of the... Uh, uh, crept in to the uh, to the church through individual church and subverted it from within. You've heard me say that very often. So I was thinking that perhaps I should insert a little bit of historical background and knowledge about that. And I was thinking about giving you one example of such a behavior of Gnosticism. And Gnostic, there is one person in the third epistle of John called Diotrephes. So I thought about illustrating that today so that you can have an idea as to what happened to our brethren in the first century. Also, you you need to understand uh, that the Simon Magus, who is the later founder of the Catholic Church, so founder of the agent of Satan, you might say, was actually, you know, as he was rejected from the Apostolic Church, he started his first uh, shall we say work or shall we say his first operation trying to actually creep in <coughs> into the uh, ranks of the true church and then of course when he was rejected and he left it and he the subsequent history shows that he went to Rome and that he basically founded the uh, the, uh, the Roman Catholic Church now, brethren, this is all perhaps important because uh, when we have history being the teacher of our lives, it shows us once again, perhaps uh, gives us the, shall we say, guidelines, guidelines for our Christian lives today, and also to be beware of some same forces today or similar forces that might have evolved over the time. Because we live in a world when changes are very fast sometimes and sudden. But nevertheless, we live in this age where they have this ecumenism, ecumenical movement. And basically all of these uh, factors in ecumenism, including the leading factor, which is the papacy, uh, popery, 
that leading factor has all stems from Gnostic teachings and Gnostic ideas of the first century. So, having some background with this, I think, would be very helpful, because then we can also understand how God has preserved us and how God continued His work through a small and uh, persecuted church all the way to our time. So what about Gnosticism? Let's see about Gnosticism before we also take a look at one of the good examples of those Gnostics in the first century. Well, as I said, it's rather a complex religious movement. It's comprised basically of a myriad of sects, you know, but nevertheless, just like today, we have in this Babylonian, Babylonian uh, Christendom, myriads of sects. But nevertheless, there, there is no reason for confusion when it comes to that very complex movement. Because there are seven facts about Gnosticism that we need to keep in mind, brethren. And uh, those seven facts are very comforting because it's not impossible to define Gnosticism. So the first fact that we need to keep in mind is that Gnosticism can be defined. The second one is that Gnosticism can also be classified, although there are no, there is no reason to waste our time on this very unnecessary process, because, you know, scholars waste much time on that, and scholars are just people who just waste much time on all kinds of things. So for us to kind of classify and uh, go through all the Gnostic, various Gnostic aspects and classify them and so on, we have not we're going to waste our time on that. Uh, the third fact is that Gnosticism is a pre-Christian, except for the doctrine of Christ's redemption. And Gnosticism existed before 30 AD in the Greek, Egyptian, and Babylonian world. The fourth fact is Gnosticism is, is a complete religious system, as a complete religious system, it began with Simon Magus, of whom we still have to, of whom I would still have to talk a few, you know, down the road, because he is the founder of the uh, Gnostic most famous institution even today called Vatican. So Gnosticism as a complete religious system began with Simon Magus when he combined, syncretized, you might say, that's the word, syncretized Babylonian Hellenic Gnosticism with his perverted form of Christianity. The fifth fact is that Gnosticism is not Jewish in origin, as various scholars think, but it is Samaritan, and that's something very important to keep in mind. The sixth fact is that Gnosticism was a distinct religion, but it did not stay outside of the church, rather it warmed its way into the church. And as I said, subsequently it just perverted the church from within, and completely perverted the church and turned it from the uh, right way, right track, into all kinds of wrong ways. Now, the seventh, the seventh fact we need to keep in mind is that Gnosticism developed in three stages, and the third stage had strong influence upon the Roman Catholic Church, which is today the leader of the ecumenical movement. So once again, those seven facts, Gnosticism can be defined... It can also be classified, but we aren't going to waste our time on that. It's pre-Christian and existed in other cultures, in Greek, Egyptian, and Babylonian world. It's a complete religious system, which was formed finally as a complete with Simon Magus, who of course combined various other uh, ideas, pagan ideas, with his perverted form of Christianity. Gnosticism is Samaritan, it's not Jewish. Gnosticism uh, did not stay outside of the church, but warmed its way into the church. And Gnosticism, of course, had tremendous influence on, particularly upon the Roman Catholic Church. Now, we should not remain in confusion about Gnosticism, because the Bible gives us the clues we need to understand this new religion of knowledge because the name of that really comes from the word gnos gnosis, gnosis or knowledge, some kind of uh, mystic knowledge that is only being revealed to those chosen. Now, beginning with Acts and Simon Magus, a Gnostic, 
and ending with Revelation, the Bible reveals Gnosis falsely so called in First Timothy chapter six verse twenty, which means a false religion using the name of Christ, but in actual in actuality opposed to the true Christ. Please, brethren, notice that the word science in First Timothy chapter six verse twenty. You'll find that word science in some translations. Let me see, I'm going to use, well, we've got various translations at hand nowadays. So that's, that's something beautiful. Uh, let me use, uh, let me see which one I could use. Perhaps American Standard Version would be, would be the good one to be used. Anyway. Okay, the Bible, open up yourself. <laughs> Sometimes these machines, they're there to actually, uh, American, did I say American Standard Version? There is also English Standard Version. Yes. Okay, let me English Standard Version and, uh, let's go to 1st Timothy 6.20. Uh, speaking about chapter 6, speaks about the false teachers, of course, and they were just spreading the knowledge that seemed to be kind of wise knowledge that seemed to be, that seemed to be biblical knowledge. First Timothy 6.20, O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irrelevant babble and contradictions of what is falsely called, here is in, uh, Engl in English uh, Standard Version, Falsely called knowledge or gnosis, exactly. So, you know, this was the admonition given to uh, young evangelist Timothy by the Apostle Paul. And so there is a false religion using the name of Christ, but it actually opposed to Christ, opposed to true Christ. And... Uh, here in First Timothy 6.20, in the original Greek, the word knowledge is gnosis, or the word science is gnosis. And what is Gnosticism, brethren, you may wonder? Well, Dictionary of Christian Biography, Volume 2, Article Gnosticism, says, In logical order we ought to begin by defining Gnosticism, a point on which writers on the subject are not agreed. Then also in Biblical Theological and Ecclesiastical Cyclopedia, written by McClintock and Strong, Volume 3, Article Gnosticism, it says, No question, however, has more perplexed historians than that which refers to the direct origin of Gnosticism. And yet, on the, base, on the basis of the Bible, Gnosticism is easy to define. And he, let me give you that easy definition. A satanic religion of dualism, combining oriental superstition with the Greek philosophy, denying God as creator and promising redemption, under quotation mark redemption, by special knowledge, gnosis, of the angelic or demon realm. So that's how you read, for example, in the book of Colossians about those who have this false cult of angels and so on. And uh, that comes from Gnosticism. And in fact, if you don't know anything about Gnosticism, some parts of the New Testament you won't be able to understand now, how can the bewildering variety of Gnostic sects be classified? Let's touch upon that because we're not going to go into any, any deep details, but there is a labyrinthal maze of Gnostic systems and speculations. Dictionary of Christian Biography, falling to page 678. Speculations so wild and so baseless that it is irksome to read them and difficult to believe that time was when acquaintance with them was, was counted as what alone deserved the name of knowledge, knowledge under quotation mark. So in spite of the fact, you know, in spite of the fact that there is a classification controversy in the academic circles, to Bible believers, those academic circles and their controversies are of no use. Gnosticism, brethren, being a religion of demons, is chaos. Being chaotic, Gnosticism could be classified from myriad points of view. However, to us, a couple of uh, classifications might be helpful to grasp the satanic nature of Gnosticism. 
The first division is division of all sects into Judaistic versus anti-Judaistic, depending on their view of God, God's law, and the Old Testament. Uh, and then the, the other division is division of sects into ascetic versus licentious, meaning sexual profligacy. Prof, uh, that's the uh, division. That's the division that was given to us by Clement of Alexandria. Anyway, so we have got ascetics, those who will just deny food, sleep, water, and enjoyment to the body, and then licentious, those who will just uh, basically indulge into all kinds of all kinds of uh, 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 fleshly fleshly activities, desires, and uh, fleshly, fleshly uh, satisfactions and gratification. Now, you may wonder when and where did Gnosticism arise? We already mentioned it's not of Jewish origin. It's of Samaritan origin. So, uh, there was a pre-Christian Gnosticism first. So, the answers, that answers the question when. Secondly, the earliest witnesses if carefully we analyze them, all agree that Gnosticism is not Jewish, but is Samaritan. And that tells us where. The best explanation of the pre-Christian Gnosis is McClintock's and Strong's Biblical, Theological and Ecclesiastical Cyclopedia, Volume 3, Article Gnosticism. Here is a quote from this publication. Ever since the conquest of Alexander the Great, <coughs> an intense interest had been felt throughout Asia Minor and Egypt in Hellenistic philosophy and Oriental the uh, theosophy. And while the old mythological fables and professed systems of positive revelation had lost their authority, many thoughtful persons had discovered under these what they looked upon as a uniting bond of truth and the elements of universal religion. The result was that, near the time of the first promulgation of Christianity, a number of new systems of religious philosophy sprang up independently in different countries and exhibited similar characteristics. They were usually formed by incorporating with the national religion what seemed attractive elements in foreign systems and softening down what was harsh and incredible in the popular faith and worship. In this way, we discover a nearly simultaneous origin of the Judaistic philosophy of Alexandria, of Essenism and Therapeutism in Egypt and southern Palestine, or the Kabbalistic literature in Syria in the, and the East, and of New Platonism among the Hellenistic nations. These were all offshoots from the same general root and not necessarily deriving anything original, but unquestionably drawing much assistance from one another. End of the quote. So, brethren, we see from this that, you know, Satan laying a very good preparation for Christ's gospel. And he always does that because, you know, Satan always tries to deceive, brethren. And if he cannot deceive, then he'll try to divide. Those are his two major, those are his two major uh, 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 tools, you might say, that he has been trying to employ from the Garden of Eden from two trees. He divided God from, you know, the main division between God and, and humankind because he led the first humans to take fruits of the forbidden tree. And uh, so whenever Jay Satan does not, does not uh, uh, succeed to divide, he just resorts to deceiving or vice versa. If he cannot deceive, he can at least try to divide. That's perhaps why currently we are seeing we are seeing all kinds of divisions in the body of Christ being divided into divided up into various organizations and so on. But in any case, Satan was laying a very good preparation for Christ's gospel. God would not allow Satan to destroy the truth, that's for sure. But he did allow Satan to confuse and deceive, you see. Satan used his already established religions to prepare for Gnosticism, and Satan used Gnosticism as at least one major, if not the major, infiltrators or those who sabotaged the true original church. Now going back to pre-Christian Gnosis, we find that 
the Platonic doctrine of God, withdrawn entirely within himself, intelligible only to the initiated, we also find dualism and a fall of spirit beings. The uh, Pythagorean doctrine, the Brahminic doctrine of emanation and hypostatizing of the divine attributes, the Parsic representation of God as light, of a dualism in which God is continually attacked by the world of matter and the eternal conflict between good and evil or darkness, and the Buddhist nations of uh, notions of a God in process of development and of souls longing to be freed from matter. Now, uh, you see, in the Alexandrian literature, we find many of those elements, and it was basically diffused among the educated classes in all those countries in which Gnosticism flourished, and it might have been the mediating agency through which the mind of the East was brought into communication with that of the West. Now, there are two more authoritative sources which prove there was a pre-Christian Gnosis. The first one is Encyclopedia Britannica, 11th edition, volume 12, page 157. Thus, the essential part of most of the conceptions of what we call Gnosticism was already in existence and fully developed before the rise of Christianity. That's the quote from this Encyclopedia Britannica. Then, <coughs> we have also a History of Doctrines, written by Karl Rudolf Hagenbach, volume 1, page 54. It says, to the accounts given of Simon Magus, Meander and Ossetius, Simon's teacher, who have become almost mythical, at least prove that in Syria, Gnostic tendencies made their appearance at an, at an early period. End of the quote. So once again, Gnosticism is Samaritan, it's not Jewish. That's very important, because Simon's doctrines were substantially those of the Gnostics, and he is not without reason regarded as the first who attempted to engraft theurgy and egotism of the uh, Magi philosophy upon Christianity in forms as Biblical Encyclopedia, page 15 and 91. The brethren, various scholars endeavor to prove that Gnosticism is Jewish. That's why I've already repeated twice that it's not. No, it's not Jewish because Christian writer Agesippus tells us that James the Just preached Jesus to seven so-called Jewish sects, to Essenes, Galileans, Hemerobaptists, Masbotheans, also baptizers, Samaritans, Sadducees, and Pharisees. Before any further comment on Samaritans, brethren, let us even see one earlier authority, that of Justin Martyr. You've all heard of Justin Martyr. Now, Justin Martyr wrote his first apology at Rome, all about 150, 150 uh, of, our, of, of our era. Now, Justin the Martyr was a Samaritan by birth, and his information is even earlier than the one that is provided by Hegesippus. And here it is, Justin Martin, the first apology of Justin the Martyr, chapters 24 to 20, 20, uh, 22 to 24. You can find that one in volume 1 of the anti nicene Fathers. And thirdly, says Justin the Martyr, because after Christ's ascension in heaven, the devils put forward certain men who said that they themselves were gods, and they were not on, not only God, uh, not, they were not only uh, they were not only persecuted you by you. Sorry, they were not only being uh, they were not only persecuted by you, but even deemed worthy of honors. There was a Samaritan Simon, a native of the village of called Gito, who in the reign of Claudius Caesar and uh, in your royal city of Rome, did mighty acts of magic by virtue of the art of the devils operating him. He was considered a god, and as a god was honored by you with a statue, which statue was erected on the river Tiber, between the two bridges, and bore 
this inscription in the language of Rome. Simoni Dei Sancto. To Simon the Holy God. And all, all the Samaritans and a few even of other nations worshipped him and attacked him and acknowledged him as the, as, for, as the first God. So this is from Justin the Martyr. So Simon Magus was brethren even considered to be a God. Now the historical context of Justin shows that he deems Simon to be the first Gnostic. And uh, at least Justin mentions him first. And yes, many other people believe that uh, Simon Magus, who appears in the Bible in the Book of Acts, was the uh, the father of Gnosticism. You see, the third earliest Catholic authority as the origin of Gnosticism is Irenaeus, scholar Irenaeus, in his work against heresies, he ascribes the oldest Gnostic system to Simon Magus from Samaria, Menander, and Saturnius. Now, Robert M. Grant, in the book Gnosticism and Early Christianity, page 70, underlines this following fact, and that fact of uh, of uh, uh, heretics Magus, Menander, and Saturnius, and Saturnius. He says, my account of the development of Gnosticism has to be concerned with the person and doctrine of Simon Magus. Now, one modern scholar insists against the Jewish theory, or that Gnosticism has originated from Judaism or from Jewish people. Hans Jonas, he says there are no early Hebrew Gnostic writings. There is only one Jewish name in early Gnosticism, and that name is Simon. But neither had it ultimate origin in Judaism, for from the strong heathen philosophy, Gnosticism underwent many modifications and accommodations. Now, Gnosticism's real origin, in spite of many erroneous claims, that it is an offshoot of Judaism, no, it is, it is of Samaritan origin. What relation did Gnosticism have then with Judaism? Well, this same author, Jonas, answers. The nature of the relation of Gnosticism to Judaism in itself is undeniable fact, is defined by anti-Jewish animus spirit with which it is saturated. End of the quote. Now you see, Hegesippus gives a list of those sects that were influenced by Gnosticism, and he mentions Samaritans among those people, and among those sects, and suppose Jewish desire for Gnosis that eventually led to the origin of Gnosticism is refuted by Jonas, because he says that the, uh, the Jewish Orthodox Gnosis of itself just cannot lead to something basically different from itself. Somebody must have taken it and made it into something new, turned it upside down. Who was the one who did so? Well, J Jonas shows that Jews would hardly have attacked their own tradition, their own people, their own religion, or so fiercely as did Gnosticism. He asks if it might be Simon the Magician from Samaria, who is, as it happens, the earliest of them all. So, again, it was believed to see already that Simon and his followers, we might say, they were the earliest of all of the Gnostics in, in the world, indeed. Now, we must not forget that Simon was the member of a very special place, place community, a group discriminated against, rejected, despised. Here we have a palpable motive for a response of resentment, aggression, and spite. And here, uh, for once, we can connect a definite meaning with much invoked, hazy term, fringes or outskirts of Judaism, at which... We are told Gnosticism originated a term that usually prompts me to ask inside or outside the line. The Samaritans were partly in and partly out and some of them apparently were very far out. Well, we see what is meant by vague fringes of Judaism. It's a term brethren used by some scholars to describe the origin of Gnosticism. Now, it really is Samaria. 
the church history and church tradition tells us that Gnosticism came into being as a religion first through Simon Magus. Now Simon had plenty of Babylonian and Persian material to work with in Samaria. So it's not strange, you know, for Babylonian mysteries to be in Syria and Samaria. The Samari uh, Samaritans were a hybrid race originally originally from Babylon and from Persia, as you can find in Second Kings chapter 17 and in Ezra chapter 4. The Babylonian customs and religions were import, imported from Babylonia and Syria to Rome. Babylon had funneled much of its uh, racial stock and so it's uh, and also its religious idea, ideas to Syria and later to Rome. So therefore Gnosticism is, you see, pre-Christian to its preparation and Simon Magus is its foundation. Now why Gnosticism? Well, brethren, we, or why, or for what purpose did Satan devise Gnosticism? We should remember that what Satan cannot destroy, he must confuse or capture, you see. Now, Gnosticism intended to become a universal religion. That's exactly what the word Catholicus means, means universal. That's what Gnosticism uh, uh, was aspiring to be. And uh, intended to be, to become a universal religion. Evidence is so abundant that even though Gnosticism had a syncretic, which means Hebrew religious background, it nevertheless was, as Hans Jonas said, a religion of its own. <coughs> Gnosticism was an in intentional deviation from the truth, from orthodoxy. And Neander says in his Church History, Volume 2, page 30, when these Gnostics with their system already made, looked into the New Testament, they could easily find in it their new religion, all their sins, their sought, they only sought for points to which they might attach it. And also, this, uh, another famous author, Adolf Harnack, in his History of Dogma, page 60, describes that the Gnostics undertook to set forth Christianity as the absolute religion and they therefore placed in opposition uh, they placed it in opposition to other religions to that of the Old Testament as well not alone to Judaism but the absolute religion which they coupled with Christ was to them essentially identical with the results of the philosophy of doctrine for, we're, uh, they, for which they had been they had now found the basis in a revelation. They were according, they were accordingly a class of Christians who, es who essayed through a sharp onset to conquer Christianity by Hellenic uh, culture and Hellenic culture of Christianity. Now, Charles William King wrote a book, The Gnostics and Their Remains, in the, and then page 9, he says, The later Gnosticism is in fact a chieflet, as well expressed it, the spirit of Asiatic antiquity, seeking to assert is its empire over the soul of man by insinuating itself into the Christian, into the, uh, Christian church. Uh, this is from Charles Wikiki, The Gnostics and Their Remains, page 9. So Gnosticism, Gnosticism had two goals, really, to pervert, confound, and confuse the true church, if possible, of course, and bring more error into the church, into the Catholic church, as at a later date. So now we have this Interest, we have this interesting fact laid bare before our eyes. So we can think about it, you know. Because armed with their deliberate perversions of Old Testament scriptures, which Jonas calls the anti Semitic animus, and then fully intending to pervert Christianity according to Satan's plan, then they warmed into the church. These Gnostics, for the most part, had no intention of separating from the rest of the church and establishing distinct communities of their own. 
They were for uniting with the ordinary congregations and uh, establishing in connection with, uh, with them a kind of theosophic school of Christian mysteries. This is what was stated to us to be Agnes Church History, Volume 2, page 33. Now, one other impa- important fact about the Gnosticism must not be overlooked, friends. The German scholar Lipsius, who wrote Gnosticism, its origin and development in 1860. So, uh, the German scholar developed uh, development of Gnosticism is similar to a curve which began only slightly off from the truth, diverged far out and finally returned closely to the Catholic Church. And this was the pattern better that followed basically the Church throughout the throughout the ages. In the last century, the pattern was again true. First it starts like a curve. <coughs> it looks only to be slightly off of the track, slightly off from the truth. Then it diverged far out and finally returned closely to this uh, mainstream ecumenical Christianity. I mean, those who made up the church in the last century, many of them ended up just like that. Many of them ended up (coughs) being scattered everywhere. And some have dropped even their attendance altogether. In McClintock and Strong's Encyclopedia, and in Dictionary of Christian Biography, Volume 2, page 602, we read that finally under the Marcionites, the Gnostic speculation approximates very nearly that of the more liberal liberal Catholic teachers. End of the quote. So, again, this is a historical background that could help you be very helpful, brethren, that you would understand the development, the power, and the fact that Gnosticism crept in unawares into the church and then spread very quickly, rapidly its own influence. Now that in resulted in various people, faithful servants, being basically kicked out and uh, being removed from the church. For example, with the young evangelist Timothy, we later don't find any records of him. So it seems that from the, the visible organized church, he was basically removed, he and those who were faithful with him, and we have no idea what uh, you know, what would be his further activities anyway, because the uh, Bible history doesn't tell us about it. However, the Bible itself speaks about a man called Diotrephus. He is mentioned in Third John, and uh, I said I'm going to use him as a as a good example of uh, of a person that fights against God and does that by using his position and trying and removing from the church the faithful members of the church. Third John, and it has only one chapter, of course. Uh, let's first review once again. Uh, review some things, historical things. You see, brethren, the shortest, the third John is the shortest book in the Bible. But it has a very powerful message for us today. Written, it was written in the late 90s AD by the aged Apostle Paul. So his, uh, it's his letters to the elect lady and Gaius, which we call 2nd John and 3rd John. They contain relevant warning for us. Why? Because as I mentioned, the last first century AD, was a time of doctrinal departure from the truth. And many, if not most, had already apostatized and given up the faith once delivered for a false counterfeit Christianity.
Christianity. John lived on on into this degenerate period. He was grateful for all for the few who were still holding steadfast against the liberal tide of the day. John warned the faithful to keep on serving the brethren and to be on guard against selfish apostates who loved to lord it over their brethren and casting them out of the church. So, in uh, 3 John, chapter 1, verse 1, the elder to the to beloved, to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth, Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health and it goes well with your soul. For I rejoiced greatly when the brothers came and testified of your, tru- of your truth as indeed you are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Beloved, this is a, verse 5, faithful thing you do in all your efforts, these brothers, strangers as they are, who testify to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God. For they have gone out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore we ought to support people like this, that we may be fellow workers for the truth. I have written something to the church, but Diotrephus, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. Here is this Diotrephus. So if I come, I'll bring up what is he doing, talking wicked nonsense against us. And not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers and also stops those who want to and puts them out of the church. Now, beloved, do not imitate evil, by, but imitate good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. We also add our testimony and you know that our testimony is true. So once again, we have this Collision, truth and error, lies and truth, you know, very interesting. Now, what else do we know from the church, from the uh, church history, brethren? Well, according to ecclesiastical history, it claims that John, after the death of Emperor Domitian in AD 95, returned from his exile on the Isle of Patmos to Ephesus. Then John went on let's call it evangelical tours, into the Gentile regions, visiting the churches of Asia and ordaining bishops and elders. In 2 John 12, and in 3 John, chapter uh, verse 10, uh, so in... uh, John 12, and in John, in 3 John 10, in verse 40, speaks of John's visitation trips, and thus it appears that these letters, at the last, written portions of the Holy Scriptures, they are living letters for the hard times of spiritual depression, which we have experienced, experienced in, uh, in the 90s, or at least that some of us have experienced in the 90s, of the last century and which we may still be, we may still experience ahead of us, particularly in the time shortly before the flight to the place of safety. Now, Second John is addressed to the elect lady and her children, as you see in verse 1. With John were The, uh, with John were the children of the elect sister in verse 13 of John 2 
a commentary's nation that lady may actually refer to a church or the proper name or it was a proper name of the woman. The Greek Kyriaki or Kyria is equivalent to the Hebrew for Martha. Kyria or Kyrios means belonging to the Lord and is more is the source of Kyrios the word the, 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 the word for church you see. Now third John addressed the uh, it's addressed to Gaius. Now he may have been Gaius of Macedonia, traveling companion of Paul, which is mentioned in Acts, 20, in Acts 19 verse 29, which says, "So the whole city was filled with confusion, and and rushed into the theater with one accord, having seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians, Paul." Paul's travel, having uh, Paul's travel companions, then Gaius, of course, baptized by Paul, and his post in the Romans 16, 23, and in First Corinthians one fourteen goes to First Corinthians one fourteen. Gaius is mentioned there. Gaius, my host and the host of the whole church, greets you. And something else, he says, I thank God that I baptized. None of you except Crispus and Gaius. Now, here we see some, again, historical background, brethren. And uh, it might be Dias of Derbe who went with Paul from Corinth on his last trip to Jerusalem about 57 AD. Or he may have been another Gaius. Regardless, the Gaius is commended for his faithfulness. Now, another faithful believer is Demetrius, 3rd John, you find him in 3rd John and in verse 11 and 12. Let us read about him. Uh, no, this is the wrong thing. We are so now, let's see. Oh, I'm having this. Let's see second John. This will be second John, right? Speaking of we should be speaking of Gaius now, but I'm uh, <laughs> my Bible is not behaving well. Second John and uh, we said that we are going to read in uh, in, 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 let me see. The notes have now been, notes have been now the third, no. Second John, yes. So, second John is, is verse one. It's addressed to the elect lady and her children. And then in verse 13 we find, with John, were the children of thy elder elect sister. Now again, you know, the commentaries, as I said, mentioned, this might be really a church because a woman Woman is a symbol of the church in the Bible, or could be even the name of a woman anyway. Now, uh, you know, Kyria in Greek means Kyrios is the word for the church. Now, the third John is Gaius, addressed to Gaius or Caius, so with C, with G, Gaius or Caius with C. So let's see the third John, the third John, which says right there in the introduction, the elder to the beloved, he says, English standard verse says, Gaius, whom I love in truth. And then, of course, you see, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health. So that's what we always pray for one another, as it goes well with your soul. So there is nothing to pray that all goes well with our souls as well. So uh, who was this Gaius? Well, perhaps this was a man from Macedonia. Because Paul had a traveling companion called Gaius of Macedonia. If you go to Acts chapter 19, verse 29, you can see this companion. Acts 19, 29. So the whole city having seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians, Paul's travels companions. This is what they're, they're mentioned. Also, there was a Gaius at Corinth. Gaius at Corinth who was baptized by Paul and by his host. 
uh, in Romans sixteen twenty three, and here is one in First Corinthians one chap- uh, chapter one verse fourteen. It mentions Gaius, my host, and the host of the whole church greets you. And then he says, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius. And there is another Gaius of Derbe, and he went with Paul from Corinth on his last trip to Jerusalem about 57 AD. Or it might be totally different Gaius, another Gaius. Regardless, brethren, the Gaius is commended, obviously, in this letter, and obviously by his good works, he is commended for his faithfulness. Faithfulness, and there is another faithful believer who is mentioned in Third John in verse 11 and 12. It's Demetrius. So verse 11 and 12, here is Demetrius now. Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. We also add our testimony and you know that our testimony is true. So we have the true believers commended for their faithfulness. And Gaius is one of them. So uh, we'll, who that Gaius might be, it could be a, a, a matter of thinking. Not, I would not say even debate. But anyway, in a time of spiritual decay, the elect lady... And her sister, their children, Gaius and Demetrius, were among the few who had not followed false doctrine, brethren. That's for sure. And John knew his life was nearing an end. He was just released from Patmos. He was now in Ephesus. His last years were in Ephesus. He's an interesting, by the way, interesting character because... You notice that his, for example, his gospel is totally different from the gospel of the, of the three. In which way different? Different in, uh, in, in the way that there are certain accounts we find in his gospel that are not found in other three gospels, you know. For example, his, uh, Jesus Christ and his talk with a woman, Samaritan woman, at Samaritan village, <coughs> at the well, is only mentioned, for example, in, jo- in the gospel of John. Uh, John also puts much emphasis in his account on Samaritans and Samaria. You may wonder why. Well, because again, Samaria, Samaritans were always being like a rival religion, rival people to the Jews. That's why the woman was so shocked, you know. You're a Jew and you're talking to me, a Samaritan woman, and you're asking me to give you water. And then, of course, she understands at the end of it, Jesus Christ tells her about certain facts of her biography. She understands that he must be the Messiah. And then she goes to the whole village. And the whole village, you know, believes and uh, accepts Jesus as the Messiah. Well, so the, 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 the Apostle John was actually giving uh, certain facts. And he was basically fighting against Samaritans and their Samaritan uh, doctrinal errors. Like the error that, you know, it's uh, that their father is Jacob. And uh, the woman says to Jesus Christ, you know, our father is Jacob. And we pray here at this mountain, as our father Jacob has said. And then Jesus Christ says, well, the time is coming when the true believers were pray in the spirit and the truth. So he's putting particular emphasis on, on Samaritans, you see. And since Gnosticism originates with Samaria... He is basically fighting Gnosticism in all of his epistles, in all the three epistles, including his gospel. Now, his gospel brings us different, some different aspects, not mentioned in the other three gospels. Why? Because John was writing his gospel toward the end of the first century, brethren. And toward the end of the first century, unlike the other three gospel writers, John, now the author, is defending the true faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Why is he doing that? Because by the end of his by the end of his life, he has already seen how the Gnostic um, how shall we call it conspiracy? Let's call it conspiracy. How the Gnostic conspiracy crept into the church and was already subverting from within. And you know that's why he expresses his joy here that you know there's still some children like Demetrius and Gaius 
who are still faithful to the true doctrine and have not followed the false doctrines of Gnosticism, the false doctrines of Gnosticism, whose main uh, leader at that time was what is Simon Magus. Simon Magus, who succeeded actually to found the universal so-called Christian Church and spread it all over the world. And that, those are the facts that we need to be aware of because <laughs> brethren, the deception is still very strong. I remember it will be sometimes in 2013, I think. Uh, 2013, and I by that time I came up with a with a booklet in Serbian language about the uh, where did the apostles go and how did they end their lives. And uh, I remember that I also had a section on Simon Magus and his false church that he founded. Interestingly enough, almost a week after my sermon in, in Serbian, which I recorded and, and spread around that time, uh, for the first time in the history, following a mass at Vatican, the Pope took the uh, remains, or bodily remains, of course, uh, what was the name of that in, in, in English language, uh, but anyway, bodily remains of, of, of so-called Saint Peter, and showed them to the believers. This never happened by them before. Now, of course, he took it from the, because under the main altar in Vatican, there is uh, supposedly the tomb of Saint Peter. Brethren, St. Peter never even went to Rome, let alone being, that he is being buried in Rome. Now, of course, those remains were not of St. Peter, those remains were of Simon Magus, brethren. And you need to know that, brethren, you need to understand that. You need to know how high and, and deep deception is. Just like now, as I'm telling you, as I, I told you, it's the World Cup at this time, that I'm telling you all of this, and the... Croatia, Morocco, Croatian masses are now on the streets, kneeling in a total fervor, versus fervor, they are praying fervently to Virgin Mary, so-called Virgin Mary, because she was never, she was not Virgin till the end of her life, praying to Mary that they may win. Brethren, again, the deception, as Satan is the author of all deception, deception in all spheres of life, including religion, is very high. The deception about the church history is tremendous. The secular history is being falsified anyway, you know, by various people, the secular history. But nevertheless, the falsification of the true religion is absolutely stunning. It is so stunning, and you, we need to understand what we are continuation of. We are continu continuation of the small persecuted church we're just a few out of humankind who have not fallen for the false religion we're just a few who have not fallen for corruption because along with the false religion usually came corruption what is the most corrupted institution today on the face of the earth if you all will just point to your finger to Vatican and say Vatican yes you would be right usually with, with, with perversion of doctrines comes perversion of character as well, and I've seen that also back in 1995 when I, almost overnight, I've seen the perversion of character of my fellow students and ambassador, who are willing, for the sake of their own advance, uh, for the sake of their own advantage, and advancing in the church, they're willing to turn on, to turn in, until their yesterday their friends just for the sake of their own advantage and advancement. They were, they were willing to turn in those friends who were not in accordance with the so-called changes, read with the heresies being promulgated into the church, into the church of God. And always with doctrinal errors, always comes this, I've seen it with my own eyes, always comes the uh, bribes, corruption, doctrinal errors, apostasy, you name it. And it's all, you know, under the cloak of Christianity, true Christianity. I've seen it with my own eyes back in 1995, brethren. It's not 
rule that we cannot rule out that things like that may not happen even in our times. Sadly, yes. Because you see, these, these fallings away from the truth, these apostasies, these uh, departures from the truth, has they have followed the true church ever since its inception. Ever since Simon Magus, you might say. And we will speak about Simon Magus a bit more, because yes, we need indeed, we need to understand some aspects and lessons we can learn from the from the history of the true church and lessons that we can learn from history because history is a teacher of life and you know in the time in a time of spiritual decay there are few very often in the church history there are few who did not followed who did not follow the uh, false doctrine and there is a great importance of doctrinal truth and that's why we need to strive to preserve always and fight for the doctrines that was already once for all given to the saints. And again, I'm going now back to John. So John was already, has already seen, had already seen what was going on with the true church. He, his life was nearing the end. He had faithfully taken care of, even of Jesus, uh, Jesus mother Mary. And uh, there was, uh, history tells us that he took her to France among the Gauls, Gaul people. That he had been also exiled on the Isle of Patmos by Emperor Domitian, where Victorinus says that John had to labor in the mines of Patmos. He had returned to Ephesus and was involved in shoring up the faith of the faithful few who remained steadfast in the truth. And he had already seen what the Gnosticism had done to the true church. And that's why, brethren, in his, in his gospel that was written towards the end of the first century, as well as in his epistles, John emphasizes the importance of doctrinal truth. Doctrinal truth, doctrinal truth. In his second epistle, second letter, he rejoices to know of even a few who are faithful to the truth. Because, as the Revised Standard Version says, because of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. So John is saying nothing can take care, take the truth from us because it lives in us by the Spirit of the Savior, the Messiah. The one who was denied, of course, by Gnostic teachings because you are redeemed and saved basically by the secret, special knowledge, gnosis, that is revealed to those chosen few. You see, that's another. F- yes, there are few are chosen. Many are called few are chosen, brethren. But you see, you see how Satan subverts the truth, and so do people who just serve Satan, whether they're nominal Christians or those who sometimes creep in unawares, as it says. You know, into the true church like Gnosticism did, and it just looked just like, just looked like the true church. Many people accepted it and then became a majority in the visible organized church and pushed out the few, those few believers out of, out of the, out of their churches. Not Emperor Domitian's persecution, not apostasy by many, not false brethren following false doctrines, brethren, nothing can take that truth from us. So no persecution by the authorities, no apostasy by many, not false brethren following false doctrines. Nothing can take the truth from us and keep that also in mind. We all must follow the eternal's commandments. We must follow the way of love. Now what is that way? It is the Messiah. Many then and many today, such as as New Age movement, for example, many people then and many today say that Jesus was just a good man that's what they would say as much, but not God, not divine, not our master, not the Lord. Brethren, this is the spirit of Antichrist. The way of love is shown in how we love the brethren. That is the primary doctrinal truth that John wanted to hammer home before he died. That's why he says Second John chapter 9, sorry, verse 9. This is New International Version, which I rarely quote, but sometimes... It's merited to be quoted. Anyone who runs ahead 
instead of follows behind. You see, anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. So they place themselves ahead of God, you see, brethren. They're a God unto themselves. They don't need Jesus Christ to return to judge the brethren because they judge the brethren themselves. This is the primary warning John gives in both his second and third letter. Those who depart, brethren, from the doctrine and attempt to come into your house, you are not to receive, not even bidding them Godspeed, says the second John verse 10 and 11. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your whole house, nor greet him. For he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. And then third John continues John's final admonition for us to follow the way of love and truth. He wishes that Gaius would be in physical health as he was spiritually healthy. And apparently John knew of a health problem of Gaius. He knew Gaius was rock solid in the truth and wished him physical health to match. It almost sounds like Gaius, like John, was an old warrior in the faith and may, maybe was battle weary. And as I said this now, my friend, my friend comes to mind, our, our deacon Richard Close, who was an old warrior in the faith and, but he was not battle weary. That man, what a wonderful in energy, what a wonderful example. And how dearly I miss him indeed. Now in spite of any physical problems or possibly even old age, Gaius was a tireless servant of the master. A follow, an example to follow, just like our Richard Close was a wonderful example to follow. Traveling brethren, brethren were being served well by Gaius. Some of them had told John of his love and friendship. These evangelist travelers had accepted nothing from the Gentiles for ministering to them. That's why in Third John uh, verse 8, this is Amplified Version, so we ourselves ought to support such people, to welcome and provide for them, in order that they may be fellow workers in the truth, meaning the whole gospel, and cooperate with its teachers. Now there are of course few of those teachers, you know, because few people remain faithful to the truth. Every person in the church should be doing something to support the work of the faithful few, brethren. Something, of course. Now, hearing reports of faithful brothers such as Gaius gave John great joy. Third John chapter uh, verse 3, again, the Amplified Version. I have no greater joy than this to hear that my spiritual, of course, children, my spiritual children are living their lives in the truth. How beautifully put. But realizing the context, the context and time when John wrote this, it is utterly amazing to note his boundless optimism, his vigor for the hard work in the Almighty's cause. There was plenty of reason for gloom and depression because of all the false doctrine, false teachers and persecution of the true believers. Perhaps John knew that those two letters would be his last recorded testimony. He doesn't hammer home the importance of keeping the Sabbath, the importance of keeping the Passover, holidays, tithing, etc. We know he kept these and all the commandments of God because of the testimony of his disciple Polycarp, Bishop of Smyrna. But John gets right to the heart of the matter and gives a valedictory, if you want, message for all time. The important thing John stresses in both his second and third letters is service to others, brethren. Service to others. Put others first, serve the brethren, love the brethren, hold on to the doctrinal truths. Now you can well just imagine that people like Diotrephus <laughs> were just all the opposite. Would Diotrephus put others first? Would he serve the brethren? Love the brethren, hold on to the doctrine of truth. No, it is all the opposite. And don't knuckle under and become like the false brethren who twist the truth and who may even put you out of the church. That's what John has hammered 
had hammered in his second and third epistle. And then, of course, we have those who put themselves first. Those who are all important in their own eyes. Let's talk about them a little bit, and this will be like the first installment, and we can continue next Sabbath. So there is another group associated with the church. John doesn't lambast them, but he cannot ignore them either, brethren. These are they who have lost the things John and others worked to build in their lives. Second John, and uh, this will be verse 8. Look to yourselves that we do not lose those things we worked for, but that we may receive a full reward. When you read this, does this, does this possibly invoke in you another scripture? Wasn't it Jesus Christ who tells the Philadelphian remnant in this Laodicean age to look to themselves, not to lose things they worked for, that they may receive a full reward, that is, then they may not lose their crown. Isn't that what Christ says? Yes, that's exactly what he says. But, you know, there are those who put themselves first, they are deceivers, who do not believe in the good Godhood of Christ and have not stayed in the doctrine. Look at verse 7. We are in Second John, verse 7. For many deceivers have gone out in the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Verse 9. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. So you see, brethren, they have departed from the true doctrines. They have departed from the true doctrines. They refuse to assist faithful, traveling, evangelizing brethren who are keeping the truth alive. When one reads about the many cases in the New Testament church of false teachers and false brethren, it's easy to get a wrong impression that these false prophets had thrown everything out and had gone back to the world, brethren. <laughs> We would love to think that way. We would hope that that would be the case. But that was not the case. Nothing could be further from the truth. The apostate church, later termed Catholic or universal, claimed to be Christian, had a form of godliness, but denied the power thereof. In John's day, this other group was dominant. They were in control of most of the public assemblies of brethren. One assembly Near Gaius was led by a man named Diotrephes. His name in Greek means nourished by Zeus. Zeus being the, uh, uh, the supreme deity in both the Roman and the uh, Greek world. Nothing more is known of Diotrephes than John's reproof of him in 3 John verse 10, 9 and 10. And let's read that one and then stop here and then before we can, we can continue next, next week. So what we have is this, 3 John verse 9 and 10. I've written briefly to the church, but Diotrephes, who likes to take the lead among them and put himself first, does not acknowledge my authority and refuses my suggestions or to listen to me. How incredible, brethren, before I continue to read this. How incredible, you think? As far as I understand the Bible, here is John, the only, the last apostle who is who was alive. As far as I could, if I understood properly, he was cousin to Jesus Christ because his mother was the sister of Jesus Christ's mother. Here we have the apostle, last living apostle, faithful apostle, Cousin of Jesus Christ, and you have this Diotrephes, this, 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 nourished by Zeus, who puts himself first and does not acknowledge the authority and refuses suggestions of Christ's cousin. Unbelievable, brethren. What an audacity. What a, what an egoism. What a 
self-centeredness. Incredible. So when I arrive, John says, I'll call attention to what he is doing. He's boiling over and casting malicious reflections upon us with insinuating language. And not satisfied with that, he refuses to receive and welcome the brethren himself and also interferes with and forbids those who would welcome them and tries to expel or excommunicate them from the church. I've read this from Amplified Version, by the way. From the church. Excommunicate them from the church. Incredible. So those who are true believers, those who are true evangelists, those who are true members, faithful to the doctrine, true doctrine, people with, people who have obviously a good standing, you might say, who have a character who is right, faithful. Here we have this nourished by Zeus, who tries to expel or excommunicate them from the church. Absolutely amazing. So uh, let's stop here and then we can continue with this bad knowledge, uh, with this good knowledge actually of this bad person. We can continue next Sabbath to analyze this example of one of those apostates who was apostate in the first century when Gnosticism, the philosophy, a, a, a doctrine which was a philosophy and a doctrine which Gnosticism and that perverted philosophy and perverted doctrine took over the true church and subverted it from within.